And so we dedicate our offerings today. We dedicate the ways in which we give ourselves back to God, that out of gratitude, out of uh, appreciation for all the things that he has done, we return from our own giftedness, uh, recognizing that all good things come from him, um, and if we have been purchased at great price, we return a portion of our gifts even now. Let's pray together God's blessing on our offerings. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you that no matter our circumstance, that we could always find a way to give. We recognize that not everyone is in a position to write a, a check with a lot of zeros to the left of the destiny point. Not everyone is in a position to make donations by credit card. Not everyone is in a position to pull a few dollar bills out of a wallet. But Father, we know that you have touched our lives, that you have gifted us, that you have given us unique individual personalities that can be used for the cause of the gospel message. That you have gifted us with natural talents and spiritual gifts that we can use for the sake of your church to spread the name of Jesus. That you have given some the, the gift of being hospitable, even when they can't open their homes to folks, but they can have a spirit of hospitality as they touch other lives, others' lives. That you've given some gifts of service, and some gifts of charity, and some gifts of administration. That you have created us and placed us in such a time and situation where we can indeed be hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, right now we dedicate all these gifts that we use for your sake. Whether they be from our finances, be from our time, be from our availability. Whether it be our, our note writing skills or our, um, our willingness to have our personality come through the phone line as we make contacts. That no matter what we do for you, that you bless it. And that you use it for the benefit that you desire. We recognize, Father, that even sometimes when we use our gifts with good intentions, you might have a better plan for what's happening. And so, Father, as in all things, we submit to your will. We ask that you receive these gifts. Bless them. Use them for the glory and the sake of your name. It's in that name we pray. Amen. It is Pentecost Sunday. Um, and in going through our hymnals and the songs that Scotch Plays Baptist is most um, used to singing, uh, I recognize that a lot of the songs we sing are not in public domain. And in being as fair as I can and um, as legalistic as I tend to be, um, in searching from our hymnal or our most comfortable songs, uh, finding things that we could freely share. Um, we have some that we typically only sing at this time. Um, and so if you're using a hymnal, hymn number 294, but if you have the um, worship packet that was emailed to you, uh, the hymn, Bring Your Vessels, Not A Few, we'll sing together. Um, three verses. Bring your vessels, not a few. <laughs>
Um, so praise uh, that that is, is taking place. Prayer for uh, a successful surgery, and we recognize that that's not the end by any means of a, of a long road. Um, but also uh, prayers for the family of the donor, um, because there, there is no easy way um, for a, a heart to become available. Um, so prayers there as well. Um, continue prayers for the travel, for safety. Uh, mindful that particularly um, once we've moved past Memorial Day, we get into the, the beautiful weather like we have now. Um, with the number of folks on motorcycles, whether uh, just a, a lone rider or riding with a group, um, and extra caution there. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of things that are happening, uh, and we need to lift those things. And, and perhaps most heavy on many of your hearts, um, racism and everything that it entails. Um, we know that it's it's highlighted um, as we've seen not only this week but in, in recent weeks um, when there is a violent death um, that seems to be race related. But we recognize that that is, is kind of the penultimate. That's, that's, that's right there at the, the highest point. Um, but that, that racism underlies so many other things. That um, just because we, in those um, far too often cases, see it percolate to the surface, uh, does not mean that it is not there, that it is not. Um, systemic and it's not institutionalized um, and we recognize like so many things like even in our own faith when we recognize our faith is both uh, individual and corporate we recognize um, racism um, all sorts of isms all sorts of, of bias and, and hate is uh, individual and corporate um, that is localized and global. And so we come to this Pentecost Sunday, this, this time of prayer right now when we recognize our unity as a church and we recognize our disunity as a people. Um, we also recognize that this is a great time to be reminded that the church does receive power from the Spirit to be something that those who are filled with the Spirit have the opportunity to be different. Um, that as we sang in our hymn, that we can empty our earthen vessels, have them cleaned through the blood of Jesus Christ, and have them filled by His Spirit. That a transformation can take place. And that as Christians, we should be leading that transformation. Formation. Let's go together now in a time of prayer. We'll begin with a moment of silence, and then I'll pray aloud for all of us gathered in prayer. Holy God, we thank you for an opportunity of stillness together. We recognize that we can be still at any time. That we can be quiet at any time. As a matter of fact, in recent weeks, we might have found a little too much stillness and a little too much quiet to be comfortable. But there's something to be said for believers gathered in worship, gathered in prayer, gathered to praise God, and gathered to be still and silent together. Father, we pause for a deep spiritual breath together. We collect our thoughts open ourselves to hear your voice. 
We take a deep spiritual breath to fill our spiritual lungs to get our spiritual blood pumping for the action ahead of us. We prepare for what is yet to come. We prepare for the very real spiritual battle of prayer. That we may be ready as our spirit joins with yours to pour ourselves out and to be poured into. And we recognize at times that's not an easy task because there's some stuff that we're called to pour out that we kind of want to keep. And there's some things that you want to pour in that we'd rather not deal with. We have become comfortable in our uncomfortableness and we like it where we are. And so we pause and take a deep breath and prepare to do the hard work before us. We prepare to pray not just on the surface for those names that have been shared earlier, for the headlines that we have heard, that we're not satisfied with merely checking down through a list, but that we wrestle with deep, powerful, spiritual challenges. That we recognize that even the things that on the surface seem so simple are very complicated. We think particularly of this one who is due to receive a heart transplant. And perhaps we've become a little used to the experience. That we forget what an incredible scientific feat it is. And that even with the greatest of science and the protocols and the testing and the drug therapies, that there are things that we just don't know. There are things that are beyond the surgeon's control. And we, we think of things like rehabilitation and anti-rejection. We think of limits that might be placed and therapies that have to be endured. And even in our excitement and enthusiasm, it is easy to forget that someone has lost their life. That this heart became available. And while we would not pray that pain on any family, we rejoice in the decision that they made to allow their loved one to continue to touch lives through the donation process. And for those families, those families that have lost someone, we know that being a donor doesn't make up for that loss. But we pray it might ease it a little bit. That it may allow, even in the midst of sorrow, a moment of hope and joy. And Father, we realize that just about everything we pray for has that same kind of dynamic, the multiple layers and things that we don't understand and things that are beyond our control. And we can see the headlines. We can read of violence. We can read of, as our, our literature teachers taught us, of man's inhumanity towards man. And we can point fingers and we can cast blame. But then when we take that deep spiritual breath before we pray and we prepare for deep spiritual work, we recognize that when we point fingers, we have to begin by looking at ourselves. Our own attitudes that underline our behavior. Our own picture files and snap judgments. Our own histories that have created a story that 
we have come to understand and be comfortable with, but that might not actually be the true story. That we have filtered things and seen them through lenses that might distort. And so, Father, we ask that as we pray for our nation, as we pray for those in authority, that we also are mindful that we need healing as well. That we need changed thought process. That the things that we've become so conditioned to believe that they are just natural instincts we know are built upon our personal histories and we need to rewrite them in the name of Jesus. Father, we pause to pray with a deep breath, a time of still stillness, quieting of our spirits. And then, Father, we get to work. We get to work in your name. We get to work as your church. We get to work as your ambassadors. We get to the work of being salt and light. And sometimes being light means we need to shine into some dark places. So, Father, we're ready. In the name of Jesus, we offer this prayer. These attitudes and the actions yet to follow. In his name, amen. We talked last week and in fact the week before about Jesus telling his disciples to get ready. And we recognize this was actually a theme of Jesus' teaching for years. Now, he might not at the beginning of the journey with the disciples, he might not have spelled out that I'm leaving and you've got to get ready, but he spent some time allowing them to understand who he was, and then once they knew that, understand what his mission was going to be, and that all of that was preparing them for the time when he did leave from their presence. And he had started to drop some hints, some indications of what, what kingdom living was going to be like. And, and as he approached his final days with them, he made it clear that part of that kingdom living was going to be something that the Father sent. That when Jesus was no longer physically present with them, that they were not alone that God was still going to be there and that God was going to be personally, directly, individually with them by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know how much of that they understood. It seems like every time we read the scripture, we read something that Jesus is teaching them that they did not grasp it or they heard it, but it was going to be a while before they could actually understand it, and maybe even a little further before they could actually apply it. And there are times that when we get in our most judgmental, we look at that and say, how could they have missed that? How could they not have understood? How could they not have seen what he was putting before them? And when we're our most gracious, we look at ourselves and see the times that we have missed those things and we extend that grace to those disciples. We recognize that while we've had the years of church teaching, we've had our years of instruction, our years of reading scripture, to see it and understand it, and they look kind of foolish for not picking it up, but then we look at our own lives and the ways in which we have lived and continue to live, and let's face it, are going to live tomorrow when we miss what Jesus puts before us. 
and we extend that grace to those disciples. And then if we're real good, we extend it to our fellow believers. Our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who might do things differently than we do, who might worship in different ways, who might vote in different ways, who might live their lives in ways that we are not accustomed to, hopefully, with some spiritual maturity, we get some spiritual grace and extend that grace to them. And then we recognize for just about everybody that we're looking at and folding our arms and shaking our heads, somebody's doing the same thing looking at us. And so we extend grace. We recognize that none of us get this right all the time. And that a lot of us don't come close most of the time. But that we keep trying together. We keep moving forward. And so from our position in 2020, with our 2020 hindsight, we look back on the disciples with their confusion and their fear and a hiding in an upper room. We look at the questions they have about what comes next, and we think, why, why don't they see this? Jesus prepared them. Just wait. Just wait. He told them, wait. How many times have we been impatient with God? How many times have we even said, but he has promised things. But we skip the part about waiting. How many times have we received what God has meant for our good, but it's not what we wanted, so we still grumble and get frustrated and say, but if only So we extend a little grace as those disciples go back and they wait. And in waiting, they wonder. And they must have had all sorts of discussions about what comes next, what is it going to look like, what will tomorrow bring. And I'm going to tell you here, in the end of May 2020, I'm betting you've been having those same conversations. Maybe not identical to their conversation, but you've been saying, when are things going to change? When are things going to get different? What's, what's going to happen? What are things going to look like a month from now, six months from now, a year from now? And you've been saying those same confusing, conflicting statements. Perhaps on one day, you wake up and everything is positive and we're going to get through this and we're strong. And the next day you wake up and say, I'm dying here. This is killing me. How can we do this? I imagine that's kind of what the disciples were feeling. They're waiting. And Jesus did not tell them how long they had to He didn't tell them how exactly is this coming of the Comforter, this coming of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, how is that going to be received? He didn't give them that information. He left them waiting. And as we wait, we identify with that. But then we get to the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the second chapter, and this is where we get this Classic information that when we think of the Pentecost, when we think of the coming of the Spirit, this is where we land. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 2. We're going to read through verse 6 and then skip to verse 12. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. 
When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Now, for some of you Baptists, this is where you become uncomfortable because they were speaking in tongues and there were other languages, and you associate that with, with some other memory and you shy away from it. But this is written for our benefit. This is the Word of God passed to us to hear how the Spirit manifests that day. To hear not only that they were speaking in tongues, but that, that speaking in tongues caused others to ask questions. And I think, maybe for you and I today, that's what we need to hear. That what God did in that instance, when he gave the Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues, and others came. It says, when they heard this, a crowd came together. And they began asking questions. Maybe sometimes. When the Spirit moves in us, and we don't understand what's going on, then maybe part of what's happening is that others also aren't going to understand, and they can come. They can gather. They can say, what is this? And it produces an opportunity. Let's skip to verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, the folks from the crowd, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them, those who speaking in tongues, and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. The crowd gathered, asking questions, what's going on? And, and as we often do when we have questions, we fill in the blanks ourselves. Sometimes we don't wait for legitimate answers. We connect the dots that make sense to us, and we come up with a theory. They must be drunk. Truth of the matter is they were not drunk, but there were some who thought that. And how many times do we find ourselves guilty of that? of taking the information we have, running it through our experiences, running it through our instincts, running it through our own bias, and coming up with an answer that is not correct. But I will say this much. The gathering and the asking the questions and even coming up with the wrong answers gave Peter an opportunity to speak to the crowd. You're wondering what's going on. You're coming up with some answers. I'm telling you, that's not the answer. Hear now the truth. Hear now the answer. And he started with prophecy. And he continues as we read, and we're not going to read this together today, but he continues to build a case for Jesus Christ being the Messiah. And people... Were converted. People believed in Jesus because they heard what Peter said. They heard what Peter said because they heard their own language being spoken. The Spirit did something that led people to the question of what is going on, that led a believer the opportunity to give the answer what's going on is Jesus. We don't always know what the Spirit is doing. We don't always understand. But we know this, it is for benefit. It is for good. It is not for confusion. It is not for division. It's for uniting all people 
in the name of Jesus. I want to point this out it's one little thing here in Acts. As we read in those first few voices, they were speaking in other tongues. They were speaking in languages that they did not know how to speak. But when we read from the prophet of Joel, it's about prophecy and vision and dream. It's a reminder that the Spirit doesn't just do one thing. The Spirit does a lot of things, and it comes out different in different folks. And we have to be careful not to judge based on how we have experienced the Spirit. Then somebody else's experience must be wrong. We have to be very careful. Now, this is the this is the traditional passage that even Baptists are comfortable with, fairly comfortable with, if we're going to talk about Pentecost, is to read this and to read through and to skip some of this spirit part and really get to the preaching part, really get to the conversion part. But I today want to look at the scripture that I did not give you in your worship packet. And you can jot down the, the reference if you'd like to and then look it up later. If you have your Bible nearby, you can pick that up. Or um, if you're on a computer or a laptop and have your phone available and want to use Bible Gateway or some other Bible app and look up the scripture. Numbers 11, Old Testament. Numbers. Chapter 11. And again, we're going to read just a couple of verses and then jump ahead. We're going to read verses 4 through 6, and then we're going to read 10 through 35. In the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 11. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this man. So we're going to stop right there. Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. The Hebrew people have left Egypt. And they're moving towards the promised land. And... They're grumbling. Now, perhaps it didn't start with everybody. It started with the rabble. The rabble among them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. The rabble started, and soon everybody was jumping on the bandwagon. If only we had meat to eat. God has done this thing. He has delivered us from slavery. He has delivered us from our cap captors. He has moved us across the Red Sea, and then those who were pursuing us, miracle after miracle. But now, we don't have meat. We've actually lost our appetite, because all we get is this man. All we get is this miracle food that God gives us. This miracle food that we don't have to do anything other than literally pick it up. This, this miracle food that we don't have to plant, that we don't have to weed, that we don't have to pick the insects off, that we don't have to harvest, we literally just pick it up off the ground. But it's not meat. Tired. Wish there were meat. I, I wish there were other things. Remember, remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost? At no cost. Your freedom was the cost. Remember the fish we ate that cost us nothing other than our lives? Other than we were enslaved? Oh, but those cucumbers and the melons, onion, garlic. Remember flavor at the cost of being an enslaved people. All we get is this miracle food from the God who saved us. Again, it's easy to wag fingers, isn't it? To shake our heads as though it was food. But what about us? 
How many things has God done for us? How much protection and, and providence has God given? And we say, yeah, would have been better with a little bit of garlic. Just, just saying. How many things we say, yeah, but I know you gave us eternal life. I know you saved me from my sins. But you know what? There were some things in my sin life that I really liked. I know that I have an eternal destination. That I can begin even now living the kingdom life. But you know, sometimes I like to dip my toes into the fire of hell. I miss that. How often is that us? That we are the rabble craving something else. Looking at the abundance and the blessing that God has given us and saying, well, yeah, that's, that's okay, but it gets boring after a while. I want something a little bit different. Verse 10, Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. Now, I don't know if literally every family was standing outside their tent wailing. But I do believe that Moses felt like that's what it was. See, again, it gets to the idea that sometimes our reality and our perception are two different things. And our perception becomes the reality. Our perception overpowers what is real. Our perceived need becomes our need. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. The Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. See, God hears the people. Moses hears them complaining. God hears that it's a rejection of him. Moses sees the challenge to his leadership. God sees it as a rejection of what he has done. The blessing that he has given that we are bored with. Verse 11, Moses. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Moses sees this and directs it back at himself. He sees their complaint. He hears what they're saying. He might understand, hey, you got this miracle food, this manna that you do nothing for, you're complaining about it, but what he hears is an attack on himself, and what he sees is God has burdened him with trouble. Why have you brought this trouble on yourself? I'm doing everything, God, why am I suffering? Why did you do this to me? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why are they my responsibility? Why didn't you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their answer? You promised it, God, but now I get stuck having to carry this dead weight. What did I do that you're so mad at me? Verse 13, where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. Moses hears their cry, and he blames God that he's stressed. Why did you do this? Why are you making me carry these people? Now, it was easy to just be critical of those folks who were eating manna and complaining about what they didn't have. And Moses is doing the same thing. God has done all these miracles through Moses. God has led Moses to do these things. Has put him in this position where he can be used to lead God's people. And he's kind of saying, you know what? It was a lot easier when I didn't have to deal with them. They're not my responsibility. God, they're yours. Why are you making me care? 
carry them myself. He has forgotten all the miracles that God has done. Just like the people saying, eh, the man is kind of boring. Why don't we have some spices? We have a little bit of garlic. If we could eat that meat that we had when all we had to do was be slaves. Moses is saying, I can't carry them. It's too heavy for me. It was never for him to carry. It was God carrying the burden. How many times does God give us a task? It says, by my power, by my might, I'm going to get this done. You are just the earthen vessel. Allow me to use you to do this. And we start complaining about all the work we've got. All we have to do is allow God to fill us up, and we start complaining about it. But what you're calling to me is going to be uncomfortable. What you're asking me to do moves me from a thing that I am content in to something where I am perhaps out of my element. I mean, that was Moses, wasn't it? Uh, I'm not a speaker. I can't do these things. God said, well, no, somebody else is speaking. Here's these miracles. Here's these signs. Don't worry. And no, you're not doing that miracle. You're not throwing down that staff and making it turn, turn into a serpent. That's me. You're going out to the water, but I'm the one actually parting it. I'm the one sending man. But Moses says, I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes, and do not, not let me face my own ruin. God, it would be better if you just kill me now. If I found favor, if I pleased you in any way, allow me to escape this. I'd just rather die. Oh, that fish that we ate for free, forgetting the cost. That life that we have, and now saying, yeah, I know you're giving me eternal life. I know you've done these things before, but man, what you're calling me to do is just too much. If that's what it's going to be like, just let me go. Just let me go. We forget our life is not ours. It's been paid for by the blood of Jesus. Verse 16, the Lord said to Moses. Now, the Lord said to Moses, and I, and I, you know, I can fill in the blank. I know how God can. He's going to strike Moses. He's going to tell Moses to just be quiet. He's going to tell Moses who's really boss. He's going to tell Moses about all the work that he's been doing and how much slacking Moses has been doing. He's going to tell Moses who's been really doing the heavy lifting. Verse 16, the Lord said to Moses, Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to me, come to the tent of meeting, that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the power of the Spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. God does not rebuke Moses. God doesn't slap him upside the head and give him a, a holy attitude adjustment. God says, I hear you. Gather seven. Seventy leaders. Seventy that you know to be leaders. Have them come stand with you. And I'm going to share the spirit with them. And they'll share the burden with you. That you will not have to carry it alone. He wasn't carrying it alone anyway. God was doing it, but Moses felt like he could not do this anymore. So God said, what you've been doing, I'm going to bring 70 more people to help share that. And they will share the burden. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. See, God shifted the, the conversation. What we see here, we really kind of see two stories going on at once. We see one story with the people complaining about the meat, and another with Moses complaining about the meat. 
So God has spoken to Moses and said, I'm going to help you deal with the people. Now let's get back to the people. Tell them, prepare yourselves. Tomorrow you're going to eat meat. Consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. Dedicate yourselves. Have yourself spiritually set apart because tomorrow you're going to eat meat. Tomorrow, that meat that you have isn't going to be an everyday thing. Tomorrow, that meat is going to be a spiritual practice. Meat isn't always a spiritual practice, but tomorrow it will be. Consecrate yourself. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. God says, I heard you when you said you'd be better off in Egypt. You know darn well you weren't better off in Egypt, but at the moment, it looks pretty tempting. It looks pretty good. You've kind of forgotten. And how many times, people of faith, have we said it was better when I didn't have all this pressure on me to be a Jesus person? It was better on me when I didn't have to live like a Christian, when I could do those things that I really kind of enjoy doing and nobody noticed. As a matter of fact, the people I hung out with, I was the angel out of the group. I looked holier than the rest of them. It was easier back then, but now you cope with all these Christians. And it's too much work. I'd rather... I think God says to us, like he said to them, I, I heard you. When you said you wanted me, when it was better than me, I heard of you. How would we feel if we really understood that Jesus heard all the grumbling that we did? Not just the grumbling we did in our mouths, not just the grumbling we did when we were gossiping with somebody, but the grumbling we did that was in our hearts that we didn't dare share with anybody else. The dissatisfaction, the disquiet. How? Would we feel if we knew that God heard those things? I heard you when you said, if only we had meat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days or five, ten, or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. Because you've rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? I heard you. I heard you. You want me? I'm going to give you me. Now, this never happened to me. And I mean that. But I've heard this happen to other people. Somebody was sneaking a cigarette. Stole one of grandfather's cigars. And mom found out about it. Dad found out about it. The uncle whose cigarette was filched found out about it. He said, Oh, you want to smoke here? Smoke this entire pack. Oh, you think smoking's going to be good here? Smoke this until you're sick and you're ready to throw up. You think smoking is great here? Keep smoking. Well, that's kind of. God's doing here. So you want me? I'm going to give you something you need. You're going to be sick of me. You're going to regret that you ever said, I want me. You're going to be looking for those days when you can go back to have a nice, bland diet of man. Verse 21. But Moses said, Here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month? Would they have enough of flocks and herds for slaughter for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? Moses is like, you're going to tell me to go tell them that they're going to have meat. I can't get meat. I can't do that. See, Moses is right back to thinking he's got to do it all. God just told him, bring 70 people. I'm going to consecrate them. I'm going to put my spirit on them. They're going to share the burden with you. I've been doing all the heavy lifting, but I'm going to give you some helpers. And he said, now let them get the people. Tell them they're going to get the meat. And Moses comes back, where am I going to get the meat? Did you miss it, Moses? God said, I'm going to do it. It's not about you. It's about you being available. It's about you doing what you're told to do and allow me to work through you. I tell you to gather the people and you complain about what you can't do. The Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short 
Now you will see whether or not what I say will come true for you. Moses, why are you questioning me? Do you think I can't do this? Do you think I would tell you to tell the people there's going to be meat if I couldn't provide meat? Now you're going to see what I can do. We should probably go there. You're going to see again and again and again what I can do. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of the elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took some of the power of the Spirit that was on Moses and put it on the 70 elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. The Spirit was on them, and they prophesied. They and, and this wasn't fortune telling. It wasn't they rubbed a, a, a crystal ball or they, they laid out some cards and told the person. But they prophesied. They were filled with the Spirit and they were ecstatic. They, they spoke things of sacredness. So that it was an obvious sign that God was in their lives doing something. That the Spirit was there. And they did that, but then they did not do it again. They did not continue to prophesy, but they did it that one time as a sign. Folks, this guy's going back, as you've heard me say time and time again, a miracle is never a miracle for the sake of being a miracle. This was done as a sign that others can see that, yes, God has placed his spirit on them. They have been selected. They have been chosen. They have not been chosen to continue to prophesy, but to do the work that God has put before them. Now verse 26, however, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They hadn't gone out. They were part of the 70, but they did not go. They were listed among the elders, but they did not go out to the tent. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Now, he probably, that young man, didn't recognize what was going on out here at the tent. Didn't recognize what was going on with those that Moses had gathered, that God had blessed. But he saw something in the camp and figured, i got to go tell Moses what's going on. Because who are these two to be prophesying what's going on? Now, Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since you spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. They weren't at the tent. They weren't part of the group. They shouldn't be able to do this. They shouldn't be allowed to do this. They're not following what my definition is of who can. Now listen, church folks. Listen. We don't get to decide what God does. We don't get to say, well, you know what? They didn't, they didn't do the things that I've done. They didn't follow the rules that I followed. They didn't go to the church that I went to. They didn't worship the way I worship. Don't allow them to do that. Joshua, say, Moses, you called these folks and you didn't call them out. They didn't come. They don't get to do this. Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them, on all of them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel will return to the camp. See, Moses had the right idea. He said that the spirit came to show that, and the prophecy came to show that God put the spirit so that they could help, that they could share the burden. And if that's the case, I wish everybody had the spirit, that everybody could show that they had the spirit, that everybody could share the burden, that everybody could do the work. And I'm not going to begrudge them the opportunity to work. And if God can use them even if they weren't at the tent, it points out it has nothing to do with the tent. It has to do with what God wants to do. And again, church folks, that's us. We want to make sure that the people who are under our tent are the ones who are doing the things of God. The people under our tent are the ones who are blessed. And, and we sometimes talk about, well, hey, Baptists, we, we have a big tent. Well, sometimes it's not as big as we think it is. And there are some folks that we want to have outside our tent. We want to choose who gets to come in. And if God uses somebody else, that bothers us a bit because they're not thinking the way good Christians need to be thinking. They're not thinking the way I am. Moses says, hey, are you kidding me? If they can do the work and God puts the spirit on them, I wish everybody would do that. Listen up. 
Listen up. Folks of Scotch Plains Baptists, listen up. American Baptists, listen up. Baptists, listen up. Protestants, listen up. Christians who identify what makes a Christian. I don't care how big you think your tent is, it's not big enough. God gets to decide who receives, whether they're in your tent or not. When we start growing, about what this world looks like. When we start grumbling about, you know what, people need Jesus, but they need to get Jesus through our brand. They get need, they need to get Jesus through our distribution network. I think God looks at us and says, are you kidding me? If I can get the name of my son into the mouths of people, I'm going to do it, whether or not they follow your protocol. We have to be very careful. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It scattered them up to two cubits. It's about three feet deep. All around the camp, as far as the day walk in any direction. All that day and night and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than ten homers, about five pounds. Then they spread them out all around the camp, but while the meat was still between their teeth. You ever get the meat stuck in your teeth? Might have eaten already, but there's still something stuck. While the meat was still between their teeth, while they were still biting into it, before it could be consumed, before it was all gone, the anger of the Lord, Lord burned against the people, and they struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was named Kibroth Hatava, Graves of Craving, because there they buried the people who had craved other food. Sometimes, Sometimes God's cutting some people off. That's a heavy thought, isn't it? Sometimes God says enough is enough. You've grumbled, you've complained, you've forgotten what I've done, you've thrown it up in my face, you have rejected me, and I'm done with you. I'm going to get my blessing done somewhere else. They, some of these folks, his anger burned against them. They literally died because they were craving something that God hadn't provided. He gave them the miracle of manna. They wanted meat. They wanted to talk about the freedom of how free fish was. They wanted to talk about having some onions and some garlic to flavor things. And they died in graves of craving. With the meat yet in their mouth. We have to be careful. When we start telling God how he's going to be God. When we start telling God how he's going to allow his spirit to work. When we start saying, yeah, God, I know you've gifted each one of us uniquely and individually by your spirit to do great things for you. But that person's not doing what I think they should. God might be saying, yeah, but that person's doing what I want them to do, and what are you doing? On this Pentecost Sunday, we need to remember what a great gift we've been given, what a powerful gift we've been given, what a, what a call we have by His Spirit to share the burden of the gospel message. And if we're not doing it, but we're going to grumble about how other people are doing it, do not be surprised if God says, I'm going to cut you off. That's enough. You are not moving this thing forward. I'm setting you aside. I mean, these are the people he delivered. He brought them up out of slavery. He brought them across the Red Sea. He gave them man. He did miracle after miracle after miracle, but he had enough. Two stories mixed together. Isn't that us? Isn't that the story of our life? We kind of want to mix our church story and our out-of-church story. We kind of want to make things clearly delineated. Oh, the story's about Moses and the Spirit. The story's about people and me. It's the same story. It's how we respond to what God has done in our lives. I have one of those little desk calendars. It's a, a, a day, separate day of the week calendar. On the weekend, it shares Saturday and Sunday, and it's the church sign calendar. The one for this weekend is, is acting good.
for church. Being good church people on Sunday. Acting good for church is like getting dressed up for an extra. I mean, you can wear a suit and tie for an extra. It's not going to show it. It's going to show your You can act right for church. You can say the right things, sing the right things, pray the right things, give the right things, but God's looking in what's going on in your heart, and he sees it, and he is not. And we start grumbling about the great thing he's given us. And we forget that he gave us the spirit to share the burden of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to again hear the good news that you have continued to touch our lives with a God presence. That you've given the spirit into our lives so that we can live for you and we can share the burden of the gospel message. That we can be comforted, that we can be strengthened, that we can be equipped, but then that we can be called and answer the call. Use us, O oh Father, in keeping with your spirit to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Our hymn, if you're using the hymn, it's hymn number 302, and we'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 4. If you're using the worship packet that was sent to you, uh, breathe on me, breath of God, the three short verses as they are printed. Let's sing together. <laughs> Thank mm-hmm. you.